Are you succeeding in life? It's a big question. Uh, I think there's an age we get to where we start to ask that, right? We're like, I, well, I want to be successful. You want to be successful, I hope. I don't think anyone plans a life where they're like, you know what? I'm good with not being successful. Uh, I think for the most of us, there is something resonating in us where we want to be successful. The issue is, how do we define success? Or what do we put up as the goal for success? And I'm here to tell you this morning right off the bat that there should be a vast difference between how we as believers in Jesus Christ define success as to how, in general, the world defines success. And we should be cautious about the reality that the way in which the world defines success and probably the way in which we define success prior to meeting Jesus Christ and giving our lives to him will still very much be a part of our thinking. And so we will still at times define success in terms of dollars and cents, status, fame, accomplishment, notoriety, all of these things, they, they, they bubble up in us, they're down in the roots of our thinking and our psyche and the way in which we construct our worldview. But God says something very different about success. God defines success on the basis of faithfulness. And so, you know, it, it's, really, it's a really good skill for us to question so that we can understand what God means when he says things like that. I think sometimes as believers, we have caught ourselves in a trap where we simply learn to repeat what Scripture says without understanding what Scripture means. And so we can, we can say, oh, the Bible says success is faithfulness. Okay, but what does that mean? What are you being faithful to that gives you a confidence that at the end of your life, you're going to have been successful. And so there is a journey that we should engage in where we want to understand what we say we believe. It's a really important journey. It's a deepening journey. It's the journey that actually equips us to stand on our own two feet amongst a world that doesn't believe what we believe and remain steadfast in that. There is a critical importance in us doing a journey of understanding our belief, not just repeating our belief. All right. Um, and so for me, as, a, as a, a teacher, many of you know, some of you may not, 10 years I was a high school teacher, uh, it was instilled in me to take people on a journey of understanding. And so uh, you're probably going to get that from me uh, over the next little while, so long as Rachel and I continue to be your pastors, we're not going anywhere, by the way. Um, but it's to remind you that I genuinely believe in the value of deepening your understanding, not just giving you a great surface knowledge of what it actually means to be a believer. So Ephesians 4 verse 1 says this. It says, Therefore I, Paul speaking, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you. Ah, oh, you feel the, the deep angst that Paul has. For his fellow believers, the, the deep, deep, he's like, I, I beg you in this. I'm not sure anywhere else in scripture Paul begs the church. Normally he's admonishing the church uh, and correcting them and adjusting them. But here he's like, I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. We haven't just been called by some in conspicuous or limited, we've been called by God as the greatest thing on the face of this planet. It's the most important thing, like it's not just a good idea. The God of the heavens, the creator of heaven and earth, the supreme being, the eternal one, the one who is and was and is to come, the Alpha and the Omega has called you to himself and then called you to something in this life. That should have major significance for you. And as we unpacked this last year, we pulled out a few things. We unpacked this idea of calling. We talked about the fact that, you know, first and foremost, we're called to him. Then we're called to us. We're called to be a body before anything else. We're called to be a community before anything else. 
So don't, don't start on the, the thing that you're called to out here, the activity, before you are solid in the community. Don't get captivated by the activity and let go of the community. Let me tell you something. The call God has for you outside of this community is not more important than the call God has for you in this community. If the call of activity takes you out of this community, you're doing the activity beyond what God has called you to. That activity should never take you outside of your capacity to be a part of this community. Now, that's not me saying that you should tick the box and be here every Sunday. No, no, no. But this community is a priority. Whether you're gathering in table spaces, whether you can get here on a Sunday, whether you join us online, being a part of this thing is more important than what you say you do for the kingdom of heaven. Out of being called to us, you're called to ministry, every one of us. We're going to talk a bit about that today because we, 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 we define ministry really badly in the church. We define what I do here on a Sunday and what we're going to do at the end of this service is ministry. It's not ministry. Ministry, by definition, means we serve. Every one of us has been called to serve in a context. Every single one of us has been called to, to serve others in such a way that we would bring the reconciliation between mankind and God himself. Every single one of us has been called to serve humanity so they might find Jesus. You're all in ministry. Online, you're in ministry. Say after me right now, I'm in ministry. I'm in ministry. Yeah, there you go. And then because of that, we arrive at kind of the, the, the place we're most used to talking about, the sweet spot, the place of our most effectiveness in serving, in being in ministry, okay? And that is, that is defined, and this is what the discovery sessions looked at, how God made you, your personality, your abilities, all right? What God gave you, we talked about spiritual gifts. They're a real thing from the Holy Spirit to equip you to be effective, okay, in the, in the work of ministry and where God has placed you, okay, which is by and large, I believe, the worst thing that we define when it comes to calling because we, we limit and we make vocation or we make our job our calling. No, 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 your, your calling is so much bigger than that. Your job is one context that God has asked you to outwork that calling. All right, so you saw a great little uh, video from Chris around the version reading plans, things, fantastic. We're super excited as a staff to equip you guys with some reading plans. Uh, there is one up there already, but let me tell you something very exciting. Uh, our second reading plan is live now. Uh, and it is entitled The Captive Cause. So uh, if you would like to go back, now that we're re revisiting what it means to live uh, captive to the cause of Christ, and you want to revisit the teaching of that series back in June, we have put together a seven-day reading plan for you around all of that content. So open up you version, uh, as Chris said, Go search, find us, follow us. The plan will be there. You can start it. You can friend each other as a table space. Friend each other, and then you kind of do the reading plan together. You can chat. You can comment. It's fantastic. I'll let you explore it. Um, but it's very exciting. It's very exciting. All right. Over the next two weeks, I want to help you with two critical components when it comes to being effective in your calling. At the end of the day, if we define faithfulness, it is being effective in what God has called us to and who God has called us to be. Okay, so if you're looking for a definition of success in life, success is being effective in what God has called you to and who God has called you to be. That's it. That's all we, that's all we have to strive for in this life. Those two things. And so the first thing I want to talk about this week is something called context. The other thing we're going to talk about, oh, you need to come back next week. I'm not going to, I'm not going to let you know. Surprise attack. I, have, I guess I approached this morning with an assumption. And we all know about assumptions, all right? So maybe I'll say it's an expectation, 
okay? That you would start the year thinking and asking God what he has for you. What he's called you to this year in 2024. In this moment of your life, whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you've got kids, whether you're without kids, whether you're pregnant, whether you're employed, unemployed, whether you've got a new job, whether you're in an old job, maybe you're in your 20s, maybe you're in your 60s, maybe you're at the start of a career, maybe you are at the end of a career, considering retirement. I would hope that you are asking the question, what has God called me to do this year? Because I can tell you something, he's called you to things this year. He has. He has. Romans 8, 28, we all love it. We all get it tattooed all over ourselves and get it cross-stitched to stick it on our wall. It says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. He's not working everything together for your good, for the dreams that you have that come from your selfish desires. I oh, know, I'm sorry. He is, he is working all things together for good according to those love, I've got, according to his purpose. He has a purpose for you this year. It's an amazing purpose. It's an incredible purpose. It's, it, it's got all of these amazing things in it. All right, I asked my kids uh, yesterday, we're trying to get the house ready, right? And, and I had to do some things. And I'm like, who wants to come to the shops with me? Which who knows for most kids is like, no, uh, no. Right? But what they didn't know is that I had planned to get them something at the shops if they chose to come with me. All right? So I'm, I'm already loaded up with blessing. All right? I'm already loaded up knowing we are hitting Donut King in a big way for whoever comes with me. All right? Or Boost Juice, because Evie likes Boost Juice. But sometimes I think we misunderstand and we think that what we want to do is going to bring us the blessing. And so actually God is loaded up. He's, he's ready to unload Donut King in your life in such a big way, but you've got to be willing to align yourself with his purpose, not yours. You've got to be willing to be like, oh, oh okay, oh, if, if you're asking me to come to the shops, I trust you enough to say, all right, I'm in. Even though, I don't know, even though it looks like it might not be something that I'm going to enjoy, I'm in because I know you're going to work all things together for my good. Number one, because I love you. And number two, I'm, I'm submitting to your purpose. And who knows, when Evie came and she got like an original sized boost juice, not just a junior, which I'm told is all she gets from you. Um, so, you know, uh, like just leveling up my dad game. Who knows, who knows that when my little girl is looking for a partner later in life, they better level up. Amen? All right, dads of daughters, you better set a precedent. Amen? Ephesians 2.10 says, He planned these good things for you in advance. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us a new in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things. Good things. All right? Please don't think the things that God has called you to do are bad things. They might be hard things, but they are good things. They might be complicated things. They might challenge you. You might have to grow. You might have to deal with some of the dysfunction in your soul. But ultimately, they are good things. And he planned them long ago for you to do. God's not making this up on the fly. All right? He's not a parent on a road trip making it up on the fly. Like, how are we getting through this? He planned these things long ago. 2024 is not a surprise to your Lord. 2024 is a part of the long planned uh, uh, life that he had laid out for you that is written in his book in heaven. Every day written, it says. And he's like, oh, I just can't wait for you to get on board, for you to be like, God, what have you got for me? We get excited about this until we try to fit it into our lives. <laughs> See, our issue is not our desire to do what God is calling us to do. The issue is how we perceive what he is calling us to do. Many of us have inadvertently been sold a lie. We have been sold a lie that our calling is this spiritual activity that we are supposed to find and add to our life. And this lie is ultimately built on this idea that there is spiritual things in life and non-spiritual things in life. And so when we're praying, we're being spiritual. But when we're doing the groceries, we're not. 
right? Like when, when, when I'm sitting down and I'm reading the Bible or I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm having a moment of silence and solitude. Really, I'm just on the toilet and I haven't taken my phone out of my pocket yet. But, <laughs> but well, yeah, that's spiritual. Anyone else's toilet experience spiritual? Move on, Nate. All right. But, but going to like Pilates, I don't do that, by the way, is non-spiritual. They're coming to church or church attendance. That's my spiritual activity. By taking the kids to school, brushing teeth, changing nappies, that's non-spiritual. And we laugh about this, but it is so detrimental to us being effective. Because what we do is we end up compartmentalizing our life. We put our life into compartments, and we have the fitness compartment, we have the diet compartment or the food compartment. We have the friends compartment. And sometimes we have time for that compartment. And sometimes we don't have time for that compartment. Okay, and so then we have the church attendance compartment because we've seen that as, a, as an add-on to our life. All right, we've seen the engagement in church community as a if I have time part of our life rather than recognizing that it is a deeply oriented component of what we've first been called to before we've been called to any activity. All right, and so what ends up happening, and this is the worst and the deepest part of it, is we end up boxing God. And so God is a part of the spiritual parts of our lives, but he's not a part of the non-spiritual parts of our lives. So we try to find a spiritual activity that fits over here with God rather than recognizing that potentially when I go to the grocery store, I'm still doing spiritual activity if I'm open to it. If I haven't closed that part of my life off because I've decided that they're spiritual and non-spiritual, we have to deconstruct, I know that's a messy word in church these days, but the idea of the compartmentalized life. We have to understand that that's not what we've been called to. We've been called to a life of wholeness, of trueness, that we are truly who we are in, in every space. That there is a, 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 a the, the new creation that is within us is, is moving out into all. And so there is an integrity in our life that is deeper than just doing the right thing. When I say I will, whoo. But it is actually the fact that who I truly am on the inside is permeating every space that I exist in. And so now I'm not just a Christian when I do spiritual things. So will I put on Christianity when I come to church? I put on my belief in Jesus when I go to table space. No, 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 no. I am that all the time. So like, I, I don't know if you know this, but there's actually no word for spiritual in Hebrew doesn't exist. To, to, and, and, and again, reminding ourselves that the whole, pretty much the whole first half of the Bible is written in Hebrew. So understanding that, that there's, you know, there's not even a word, because there's no differentiation. The worldview that constructed the first half of our, or two-thirds of our Bible didn't consider a separation of spiritual and non-spiritual, so much so that they didn't even need to divide between the two. They didn't need to define a word to separate the two. It just was. Everything is spiritual. Going to the grocery store is spiritual. Changing a nappy is a spiritual experience. Sometimes it's because things need to be cast out in the name of Jesus. All right? Amen. Cooking a meal is a spiritual experience. Where's everyone who loves hospitality? Who knows? Preparing a beautiful table for people to come and gather around is a spiritual activity, right? We bring the gifts the Spirit has given to us into a context where they're able to be enjoyed and experienced by other people. We are creating an expression of our spiritual nature in real life. And we have got to start removing some of the barriers that we have used to separate God from the rest of our life. So that, oh, well now, now calling that thing I do for God, well I have to find space for that over in the box that I have allowed for my spiritual activity and I'm barely able to make it to church because the rest of my life is so full and I'm barely able to make it to table space because the rest of my life is so full. But what, now I'm supposed to add a spiritual activity as well? The danger in all of this is that we end up 
these boxes and that thinking causes a deep dissatisfaction with our life because the spirit in us desires for us to live decompartmentalized. He wants to be a part of everything. And when we box him and we live with this sense of, well, it's spiritual over here but not over here and we keep him out, there is a, there is a, a, a dissonance deep inside of us that we often can't put our finger on but it, but it comes out as dissatisfaction. We just can't get satisfied with life and we end up trying things and we end up changing this and changing that and really we're on a pursuit for satisfaction but we don't realize the satisfaction or the dissatisfaction is not oriented around what we are doing or not doing. It's oriented around the fact that within us we have separated the spirit of the living God from all of our life and we have kept him in a little box and he wants to be permeating through all of us and so there is this dissonance in our spirit and we get frustrated. And we get annoyed at the church because the church is putting all these expectations on me. And we get, we get bitter at people that seem to have sorted it out. We live our life doing maybe what we're good at, but it doesn't feel spiritual, so we question if it's a calling. And so we come in a series like this, and you have your pastor saying, you have got to be about the call of God on your life, and you read scriptures, and you're like, yep, yeah, I see it. I see that I should be doing this, but even in that, you have separated what you are doing and what you're good at and what brings you joy and what you feel fits with all the stuff we did in the discovery session. You're like, well, that all fits what I'm doing, but deep in you, there is this lie that has separated that from it being a calling. And so now, now you're like, well, you're like this on the inside. And you, you're living with this dissatisfaction and discontent and frustration and it just curdles away on the inside. This affects men in particular. Can I be honest? Yeah. Something in us is hardwired for purpose. We thrive. We thrive with a purpose, right? For those of us that are sold this lie, our issue is that we feel like we have a purpose, right? Like maybe it's, maybe it's building a business and you felt like you stepped out. You're like, I felt like this on my spirit from God to go and do that. And I'm building a business and you're on purpose and you're out here with a purpose and you're loving it. But you feel this discombobulation on the inside because somewhere along the line, you decided that building a business wasn't spiritual, and so although you feel like you're on purpose over here, you feel disconnected from the purpose that should be spiritual over here. And so now you feel like you, you, the purpose you love and you want to like, keep driving for is disconnected from the purpose that you should have. Being a dad, being a doctor, being a lawyer, being a teacher, I don't know what it is, but man, we, we so struggle when we do this, we compartmentalize God out of our job. We compartmentalize God out of our parenting. We compartmentalize God out of our marriage. We compartmentalize God to the spiritual activities. And the thing is, we get so much satisfaction from purpose that over here, we're doing things that actually make us feel good to some degree. But we, we lie to ourselves thinking that, well, but I should be doing something over here that makes me feel good. And sometimes the things over here don't feel good. Reading the Bible's hard or praying's weird. And so you want to know what happens? We slowly drift. We drift out of the spiritual activity to what makes us feel good. Because we have this desire to satisfy this need for purpose. And men slowly but surely drift out of community because they haven't been told that what you do over here is deeply spiritual. In fact, God has a purpose for you in this place over here. God positioned you here for a reason. He positioned you here on purpose. He told you to start that business for a reason. He told you to become a teacher for a reason. He told you to become a dad for a reason. He gave you your spouse for a reason. And it's far deeper than you think because it's spiritual. 
And I'm here to tell you right now this morning that you don't need to disconnect the spiritual purpose that you hear about in this place from from the purpose that you have constructed over here that you think is non-spiritual. No, 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 no. They are the same purpose. There's one guy who's happy about that in the church. Yes. Come on. Don't get me started with time. Because we always use our time according to what we value. You can't get away from that. We can make excuses, but the truth is our, our, our calendar indicates our values. And so men, again, when we're getting more joy over here than we are over there, do you know what we do with our time? We fill it over here. If you realised the value of the deep calling you have to community and that in that space, the Spirit of God fuels you for what he has called you to over here, you would never devalue community. And that is a big difference between the spiritual activity box we create and the the spiritual and the non-spiritual. It's understanding that first we're called to us And out of us, we are encouraged and built up and reminded that we are the body of Christ out extending the kingdom for him. And suddenly you're reminded that everything that you're doing all through your week is building the kingdom. It's extending the kingdom. The only question you have to ask is, God, what does that look like this year in the space that I'm in? So business leaders, what does it look like for you this year, not just to build a business that's about profit? Because can I tell you something? God doesn't need money. The reason you're called to business is not primarily for profit. The reason you're called to business is to extend the kingdom in the context of your business. So how are you cultivating an atmosphere, a culture that is kingdom oriented? How are you bringing peace and joy and beauty and creativity through your business? How are you you changing the lives of the people that God has brought under your leadership in the business context? Parents, how are you not just raising a child to make sure they don't make dumb decisions in this life? How are you just raising disciples to know and have a relationship with Jesus Christ? You have a spiritual purpose that permeates all of your life. Your marriage it's not just a non-spiritual thing that you relationship that you have your marriage is one of the deepest spiritual relationships you have and can I tell you when we get that right in the church it should be a beacon of light out into the world and reminding them that you know what this thing is amazing but it's also spiritual and when God permeates it it becomes possible I'm going to land this plane we're going to pray for some people Matthew 6, to 23 says this. Strange verse, Nate. It says, your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, the whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And here's the crux. Here's like the, Jesus is ramming at home. If the light you think is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. This scripture is talking about perception and deception. For instance, if you believe that how you perceive is actually in alignment with with God, light, but it's actually not, how deeply you are deceived. And many of us have been sold the lie, and therefore we perceive life with boxes. And how deeply we deceived we are if we actually believe that that is how life should be. We have to allow ourselves to re-perceive life in the way that God wants us to so that light can fill the whole of our body. So I want to have an opportunity right now, kind of mid-message, to pray that people, you guys would have eyes to see. That even right now, maybe you would begin to see that you have compartmentalized God. You have created this spiritual side to life, 
and this non-spiritual side of life. And you are suddenly seeing. It's like, it's like what you thought was light, but it's really darkness. The way you perceived it actually was, was, was a deception, right? You are starting to see that, oh my goodness, it's, I've been doing this wrong. And that as you see afresh that God has actually everything with him is spiritual. Wherever you go, whatever you do is spiritual because you're, not, you're never separated from him. He lives within you. It's, it's always a spiritual activity because we are spiritual beings. We can't do something separate from who we are. We're spiritual. It's spiritual. It's just that it's in our thinking. Our perception has caused ourselves to be deceived into separating God out of the spaces that he has actually positioned you in. And so I want to pray right now. Can we bow our heads? Is that right? Just really quickly, just bow our heads. If this message is speaking to you and you feel like, wow, I've just realized I have compartmentalized God, and in doing so, I am living in some of that discontent, some of that, I, 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 I'm experiencing the separation of spiritual and non-spiritual. Can you just wave at me a little bit? I want to pray for you. Yeah, wow, awesome, awesome. Love it, lots of, lots of men, fantastic. Father, right now, I'll pray a simple prayer for those online responding. Eyes be opened. In the name of Jesus. Even now, I believe you're going to start seeing the context of your workplace as a spiritual positioning. You've been positioned there on a spiritual mission and purpose. And it is to bring the kingdom into that place, to bring creativity and excellence and joy and peace and light and life into that place. Those that are leading people, you have been placed there to lead them in such a way that they grow and develop and you can influence them for the kingdom of heaven. I pray you would begin to see the reason you've been placed in the family you have, with the wife or the husband that you have, or the kids that you have. You've been placed there with spiritual purpose. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Awesome. So my, my prayer is that as you leave this place today, you would have a sudden recalibration that all of your life is to be lived undergirded by a spiritual purpose a purpose that is twofold number one to bring the kingdom the components the atmosphere life light joy peace creativity let's do our jobs to the best of our ability let's be great examples let's be punctual let's let's do the extra let's go the extra mile all of these things right? The second thing is to bring people to reconciliation with Jesus. We're not just there for productivity. We're not just there for profit. Teachers, you're not just there for great grades, although I believe that's important because we should be excellent in what we do. You are there so that people might find Jesus. You're there so that you might bring about reconciliation between man and God. That is the ministry. That is the service we have all been called into. You are a minister of reconciliation with your spouse, with your husband. You're a minister of reconciliation for your kids. You're a minister of reconciliation for your friends. You're a minister for reconciliation for your classmates, for, for, for your colleagues, for the people that you employ in your business. You are there on a far deeper spiritual purpose than you have probably ever perceived if you have lived under the separation of spiritual and non-spiritual. Never underestimate where you are. It is God-ordained and it aligns perfectly with who he has designed you to be. Nobody can be as effective as you in the place you are. 